Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. Genealogies are important when we find them in the Scripture. Now, why do I emphasize the importance of biblical genealogies? Well, the reason is this. Because in the New Covenant, Paul speaks and he warns us. He warns us about giving heed to genealogies. But it's important that we understand something. When Paul says this, he's not speaking about those genealogies we find in the Scripture. Obviously, if they're Scripture, they are inspired by God. They are provided to us for revelation. They are historical. They are accurate. And when we learn the truth of them, and we always find within genealogies, in the midst of them, information that has great revelation that we need to apply to our life if we're going to understand the message that God has for his people. So when Paul says, take heed, be leery of genealogies because they can be a source of conflict or doubt, they are not edifying, he's not speaking about the genealogies we find in Scripture. You see, during the days of Paul, and when I say during his days, I just limit it only to his life, but before and after as well. But during that general time period of Paul, we find that uh, spiritual leaders, especially those in Judaism, they would take characters out of the Bible and individuals from their age or before, and they would link them together in order to create a message, something that they would want to convey to other people. And what Paul is saying is because those genealogies are not inspired by the Holy Spirit, because they are not in the Scripture, he says, I warn you, I caution you to stay away from those. Those are not a source of edification. They are not a source of revelation. They do not come as an outcome of inspiration of the Holy Spirit. No, their origin is of the thoughts of man, men that are not even believers in Messiah, those that are devoid of the Holy Spirit. So those are sources of conflict, doubt, and lack the ability to edify, but certainly not those of Scripture. Now, in Genesis chapter 5, and if you have your Bible, I invite you to turn there right now, Genesis chapter 5. We're going to encounter lots of numbers. And it would be possible to also, in the midst of our study of Genesis 5, put significance on these numbers as an additional source of revelation. But I'm going to refrain from doing that in this study. I want to focus on the simple, the clear revelation that we find in the text. Not doing a lot with the numbers, but simply staying with the words of the text. So let's do that. Genesis chapter 5 and verse 1. Now, in some ways, we're going to find a review. This scripture is almost like a summary, but there's also great amount of new additional information that we need to understand. And sometimes this new information is taking an old truth that we learn and putting a proper understanding on it. You'll see what I mean in just a moment. Look, if you would, to verse 1. Genesis chapter 5 and verse 1. This is the book, and the next word is toldot. Toldot means genealogies. It's in the plural, or lineages. And this word can also be thought of a historical documentation. So what we're 
reading about is historical in nature. We're speaking about real times, real years, real people, and all of this is for the sake of understanding God's revelation to us. So the man of God might be equipped for what? For every good deed. Now we're not saved by those good deeds, but those who experience revelation that has led to an understanding of the gospel, that one has responded in obedience to the gospel, re re receiving that free gift by the grace of God, being born again by the mercy of God through the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Such a person is going to want to know God's truth and apply it to their lives so that they can do good deeds. Look at verse 1. This is the book of genealogies of man in the day that God created man. Now, first and foremost, we see a summary statement reminding us that not just was man created, but man was created by God. That is the source of his origin. God created man. The second thing we see is that man's creation did not happen by accident or chance, nor did it take place over an extended period of years, like hundreds of thousands or millions or billions of years. That's not what we see. Rather, we find that man, look at what the scripture says, verse 1. This is the book of genealogies of man. In the day, there it is, in the day that God created man. And we've already seen that that term yom for day literally refers to a 24-hour period in this context. Notice the second half of verse 1. In the day that God created man in the likeness of God. Now that's an important statement because this phrase, bitmut Elohim, in the likeness of God, refers to behavior and also every other aspect. Now, that does not mean that we become divine. It doesn't mean that we become God. Those things would be ridiculous to try to, to take out from that word. All it simply means is this, that God created you and me in order that we might be like him that we might think like him, that is, make his decisions. How he would want us to decide is what he would do. And not only are we supposed to think, we're also supposed to speak like God, say the things that he would want us to say in a given situation, and also do the things that he would do. So we're called to be like him in thought, in word, and in deed. That's what we can derive from this first part of, of this verse. Notice something else at the end of the verse. It says, In the likeness of God, He made Him. He made. God made. Not out of chance, not out of some haphazard manner, but rather we learn God spoke and he formed man from the ground. Some would say the, the dirt, that's fine. It's the Hebrew word Adama. We talked about the fact that, that the term Adam comes from the Hebrew word Adama, which means ground. What caused man to be different is that God breathed the breath of life into his nostrils. What does that mean? God spoke life into him. And that's why it's so important that we see what we're learning in verse 1, that God made him. That shows intent, that we are how we are because God wanted it to be so. Now look at verse 2. Verse 2 is going to, initially in that first part of the verse, it's going to reveal to us, and we talked about this as well in our study of chapters 1 and 2 and 3 of the book of Genesis, that the term Adam is inclusive. We frequently translate that word Adam as man, and we should not think that it means solely a male. Why do I 
teach that. Look at verse 2. Male and female, he created them. So the them is Adam. We just learned that he made man. He created man in a day. But when he says man, he's not speaking simply of the male, but both the male and the female. So male and female, he created them. And what else did he do? Well, this is not new revelation. It is a review. But the next phrase is the new revelation. We learn why God created Adam Bechava. The reason being that he wanted to bless them. It says here, male and female, he created them and he blessed them. Now, when we look at how the scripture here unfolds, there's a relationship between verse 1 and verse 2. Verse 1, God created man. Verse 2, we find that same statement. Verse 1, in the likeness of God, he created man. In verse 2, we find that not only did God create man, but he also blessed him. Now, if we use the proper methodology for interpreting Scripture, we're going to see, and this is a very important point, it is only when we walk in the likeness of God, and of course that word walk means behave, our life. So it's when we live, whether it's thinking, speaking, or doing, should be all three. When we do so like God, what is that going to lead to? Well, what verse 2 is revealing to us that such behavior is how we're going to find blessing. It's going to lead God to bless man. Now, this is a law that God puts into force. You live like me, you'll be blessed by me. Look on the second half of verse 2. And he called their name Adam. So God spoke and gave both Adam Bechava, Adam, meaning male and female, he gave them a name. Name is synonymous with character. So God put into his human beings a character. Now, of course, sin has affected that. But there is a character which by means of redemption through the blood of Messiah, we can regain that we can be given the potential to live according to that character. So over and over in the scripture, we find in this passage that God is speaking about a lifestyle, a behavior that is synonymous with his character. He gave it to us so that we can do something. And what is that? Well, keep reading. We find, and he called their name Adam once again to emphasize this in case someone skipped over it in the day that he created them verse 3 and adam lived 130 years and he begat now again this word literally we could translate it and i will at times that the man gave birth now in english we kind of pull back don't we because men don't give birth women give birth but in hebrew the idea is that the man fathered the child. And that's all it's trying to say. It's not so much a word of who gave birth to him, but understanding that both the male and the female were involved in this. So in Hebrew, it's just as proper to say that the man gave birth as the woman gave birth. We might say man gives conception. Of course, God uh, uh, blesses that and allows that. But man gives conception and the woman gives birth. In Hebrew, we just have a summary thought. The male can give birth, the female can give birth. We say the man begat, the woman gave birth. But in Hebrew, the same word is used for both. So once more, verse 3. And Adam lived 130 years and he begat in his likeness and in or like his image. Now, what's important here is how the scripture is unfolding. In verse 5, we have that word likeness. We're supposed to behave, do, think, speak 
like God is, like he would do. But here we have an additional phrase, not simply the phrase, bit buto, but also ke tsamo. What is that referring to? Well, the word Salem, and we talked about this back in chapter 1, is a word of reflection. It's a word of image. In fact, most Bibles say, in the image of God, he created man. What does that mean? Just like we talked about. We're called to reflect his likeness. Now, two things are said here. We reflect his likeness when we behave like him in thought, word, and deed. But the outcome of such behavior is that God's presence or his glory is going to be manifested. That's what the word Salem is speaking of. So here's the total picture. It is when we do those things that we live like God, we become an instrument of his presence, his glory in a situation and that is going to lead to a blessing. Some have said the blessing is that God's glory is manifested through us. And I certainly don't disagree with that. I want to emphasize that again. Some people say that, that when we behave like God, well, the blessing is that we manifest His glory. And that's certainly a true statement. Look on. We find in the next phrase, and he called his name Shet. Now, usually, Shet is pronounced Seth in Hebrew or in English. But what I want you to, to view here is that the subject of, of, of verse 3 at the end where it says, and he called, that is Adam. Adam called the name of his son Shet. Now, why is that important? Well, go back to verse 2. We find God calling and giving the name to Adam, to the man. So now, Adam is behaving like God. Do you see what the scripture is trying to say? So God gave the name to Adam, and now Adam is giving the name to his son, Shet. He's behaving like God. And we read in this passage, look now to verse 4. And the days of Adam were, after he gave birth or begat Shet, 800 years. And what took place? It says, and he gave birth or begat sons and daughters. Now, that's a summary statement. We find that there was 130 years until he begat Shet. Afterwards, there was 800 years. And we're summarizing everything because we read, and he gave birth or begat sons and daughters. Now, this is important because this explains what we talked about last week. And that is, where did Cain find his, his wife? When it speaks about people, who may want to put kind to death for killing Hevel. Who were these people? Well, they were the numerous individuals that Adam Bechava had given birth to, that were born through these parents of all humanity. That's what we read here when we find this summary statement, that they gave birth to, or he gave birth, and we know that that word can be inclusive to both, but more precise here, Adam beget sons and daughters. And then what else do we find? Well, look now to verse 5. And all the days that were to Adam, which he lived, was 930 years, and then he died. So 130 years, 800 years, 930 years total, and during this period of time, there was numerous sons and daughters born to him. Now move on to, to verse 6. We've already learned that Shet was, was born. And now we're going to focus in on that generation. Verse 6. And Shet lived 105 years, and he begat Enosh. Verse 7. And Shet lived after he begat Enosh. 
he lived 807 years and he beget sons and daughters. So this same formula is going to be seen over and over. All together, we find 105 years plus 807 years. Total, we're going to read that he lived. All the days that Shet lived were 912 years, and then he died. So from one generation to another. Once more, we're finding, and people find this hard to understand today, but, but things were different. See, the effects of sin had not grown. There's a consequence of sin, and one of it is disease. Sin weakens the body. These are the early generations. And we sign, find people living many, many more years than today. In the next chapter, chapter 6, we're going to see that God, for the most part, tapped the days of man to be 120 years. Whenever someone lives longer than that, and there were, that has significance. That tosefet zaman, that, that additional time, always has meaning. It always should be emphasized in understanding that individual. Let's go back. Look, if you would, to, to verse, verse 8. And all the days that were to Shet were 912 years, and then he died. Verse 9. And the life of, of Enosh was 90 years, and he begat Canaan. Canaan, don't confuse that word with the same word that sounds similar, but it's spelled differently. This is the word Canaan, not the word like the land of Canaan. Very, very different. So once more, verse 9 and Enosh lived 90 years, and then he gave birth to Canaan. And Enosh lived after he gave birth to Canaan 815 years, and he bore sons and daughters. Verse 11. And all the days that were to Enosh were 905 years, 90 years, plus 815 years, 905 years. And then it says he died. Look now to verse, verse 12. And Canaan lived 70 years, and he begat an individual by the name of Mahalael. And Canaan lived after he begat Mahalael, 840 years, and he beget sons and daughters. So what the scripture is trying to say, these long periods of time for someone to live from our vantage point, and what do they do? Throughout it all, they were giving birth to children. What's the significance of that? Well, what's the first commandment that God gave to, to mankind? To be fruitful and multiply. And that's what the genealogy here is speaking about, each of the genealogies. The reason why it's called todot, genealogies, is we're talking about each man having his own lineage. There's a relationship, obviously, between them, same family, but the term is in the plural. Well, where do we leave off? Look, if you would, to verse, verse 12 once more. And Canaan... He lived 70 years, and he gave birth to this man, Mahalael. And Canaan lived, after giving birth to Mahalael, 840 years, he bore sons and daughters. All the days of Canaan were 910 years, and then he died. Verse 15. And Mahalael, he lived... 65 years, and he beget Yared. And Mahalael, he lived after giving birth to Yared 830 years, and he bore sons and daughters. All the days that were to Mahalael 
were 895 years, and then he died. So over and over, we're seeing similarities. Now, nothing outstanding or out of the ordinary is happening. We find that God is very specific. He's giving us historical information. He's giving us the year that the key child of that family was born. He's giving us how old the father was. And then we find how many years he lived after giving birth to that child. And we find that he was fruitful. Many sons and daughters were born and then he died. And we have a summary statement of all the years of his life. But something's going to happen significantly in a moment. We're going to find that certain individuals had a unique call upon their life. Why do I say that? Well, let's press forward. Look, if you would, to the next phrase. Look, if you would, to to verse 17. Let's do verse 18. And Jared lived... 162 years, and he gave birth to who? Hanok. And Jared lived after he gave birth to Hanok 800 years, and he beget sons and daughters. And all the days that were to Jared were 962 years, and then he died. But notice something, Hanok was born. Why is that important? Well, up until now, everything has been similar. There's nothing been under out of the ordinary. But now in this generation, we have someone being born by the name of Hanok. And Hanok is going to be special. Why? Well, look now at verse 21. And Hanok lived a total of 65 years, and he begat Metushalach. And here's the additional additional information. We find that Hanok, he walked with God. Now, we would expect that word to walk with God to simply be Hanok Halach Im Hashem. But it's not simply the word Halach or Lelechet in the infinitive to walk. It's the word Hit Halach. And that word means to go back and forward. It has a reflexive quality. And what it speaks of is a consistency. See, other people, well, they demonstrated God's likeness at times. But Hanok was different. I mean, he consistently lived out the call that was upon all of humanity. And what was that? To walk with God. So once again, look at verse 22. And Hanok, he walked with God after begetting Metushalach 300 years. And he bore sons and daughters. And all the days of Hanok that were to him were 365 years. Now, what stands out? Well, he lived a relatively short period of time. I mean, he lived less than half of everyone else. And he's the one that was walking with God. Something else that we see here, it doesn't say that he died. Death, meaning death is synonymous with sin. We don't see sin taking its effect on Hanok. Why? Because he walked with God consistently. Now, does that mean that he never sinned? No, all have fallen short of the glory of God. But in a unique way, in a mighty way, Hanok, that's Enoch in English, he walked consistently with God and he lived 365 years. Now, the rabbis emphasize that uh, um, there are 365 positive commandments, 248 negative ones, but 365 positive ones. And they may mention here that Hanoch, I mean, he lived a positive life. He did what God commanded him to do. And they also say when someone is obeying God, when they're doing what they should do, as a consequence of that, you won't do what you ought not do. So Hanoch, 
he lived a total of 365 years. But it never mentions that he dies. Read verse 24. Hanok walked, and it's that same phrase, Vayit Halak. He walked consistently with God, and he was not. That means he didn't die, but he wasn't anymore on the face of the earth. Why? Ki lakak oto Elohim, for God took him. So we see something else. When someone has relatively a short period of life compared to others, it doesn't mean that God's not pleased with them. No, it can mean that God is exceedingly pleased with them. And we learn in the book of Isaiah that sometimes God takes the young because he's so pleased with an individual that he takes them what we would call early. Well, let's press on to verse 25. And Metu Shalach, he lived 187 years, and he bore sons, or he bore a son, or he gave birth to Lamech. That's what it says in the verse 25. Now verse 26. And Metu Shalach, he lived after begetting Lamech 782 years. And he gave birth to sons and daughters. It came about all the days of Methuselah were 969 years and he died. And we find, keep reading, and verse 28, And Lamech, he lived 182 years and he gave birth to a son. Now, here again, it doesn't simply say the name, it just says a son. And he called his son Noah. A different language, meaning a different form, grammatically different. The paradigm was broken. Why? There's going to be something significant. Whenever there's a change in the normal pattern, it's to tell us in the scripture that something is significant. Look back, and Lamech, verse 28, lived 182 years, and he gave birth to a son. Normally it says, and he begat and the name, but it doesn't have the name, it's just a son. And he called his name Noach, saying, this one, he will comfort us from our deeds and from our toil of our hands. Because the ground which the Lord has cursed it. So Noah is unique. This one is going to be used by God to do something. Now, if you go back to to Genesis chapter 4, you find that the earth was cursed by God. And that curse was going to bring about uh, sweat and, and just hard things for man and now noah came and noah means rest noah was going to give rest he was going to and we'll see this next week give an invitation away from this world because god was going to what in the days of noah he was going to destroy the world this cursed world he was going to destroy and in essence he did and noah was hopefully going to be a means to bring about a different reality than the current one that was repeatedly experienced in that generation, which was failure. That's what Lamech is saying, that my son is going to be a source of deliverance from, notice what he says, he is going to comfort us from the works, our works, and the the sweat or the grievous work of our hands because of the ground which the Lord cursed. Verse 30. And Lamech, he lived after he begat Noah. How long? It says here that he lived 595 years and he begat sons and daughters. So not just Noah, but many others as all the others have been mentioned. Verse 31. And it came about All the days of Lamech were to him 777 years, and he died. 
And it came about, look at verse 32, and it came about that Noah, he was 500 years old. And Noah gave birth or begat Shem, Ham, and Yafat or Yafet. Now, we find a very important message to us. All the others in this genealogy were only spoken about one child. Noach, three. Now, what is the number three? Three has to do with revealing something. God is going to use Noach to reveal his truth. That's why we see in the book of, of, of in the New Testament, we find that Noah was a preacher of righteousness. He was going to reveal God's righteous truth. And what is that? Well, to listen to God and respond and find deliverance. So, unfortunately, humanity didn't listen to God. They didn't respond properly. And therefore, humanity, with the exception of Noah, his three sons and their wives, and the animals, all the rest were destroyed. So when we look at Genesis chapter 5, we see paradigms, things repeating themselves. But pay attention to where the changes are. Again, we didn't deal with it for the most part, but these numbers that are recorded, how long they lived until they gave birth to that key child, and how long they lived after giving birth to that key child and the sum total of their, their days, all of those numbers are sources of revelation. Perhaps sometime we'll look at them, but for the, the, the course that we're doing now in our study of Genesis, we want to move forward briskly. We want to pay attention to the larger picture so that we can grasp that and hopefully come back at a later time to look at the fine clues of Scripture that we might see all of God's revelation. Why? Because we want all truth and the Holy Spirit. He's accessible to every believer to teach us all truth so that the man of God, and that includes the women of God, that we all might live according to His will, that we might become like Him, that we might manifest His glory, and people will see the presence of God in our life and through our life and desire that same beautiful relationship that we have with God that they might be led to join in on that same experience. Well, we'll close with this until next week and we start our study of Genesis chapter 6, focusing in on the one that we mentioned briefly at the end of our study, Noah, that is Noah, and see what message that God is going to reveal through this man's life. Until next week, my hope and my prayer is that God will richly bless you in the power of his word. Shalom. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel. <music>